Hey folks, welcome to the Give Me Liberty podcast. Today, we're discussing the term conservatism. What does it really mean? And if there was a book, let's say that somebody wrote about it, would you be interested in taking a look? Dr. Yoram Hazoni joins the Give Me Liberty podcast starting now. And welcome back to the Give Me Liberty podcast. And today I have a very special guest, Dr. Yoram Hazoni. He's authored numerous books, most recently, Conservatism, A Rediscovery, and also The Virtue of Nationalism. He's also the founder of the National Conservative Conference that's having its third uh, annual meeting this year, I believe in September. Is that right? September 11th through the 13th. And you're invited. Fantastic. Well, Dr. Hazoni, welcome to the Give Me Liberty podcast. Great to have you on. What terrific to, to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, I, I wanted to show our audience this book. I think it's really, really fantastic. I think it's certainly, um, when you think about all the things that, that could be talked about in 2022, um, you know, the future of conservatism, not only in America, but really in the Western world, uh, in terms of, of, of um, a paradigm of, for understanding our values, um, for understanding tradition, for understanding um, those things that transcend. I think that's so important that we want to strengthen the foundations that remain in society. And we also want to fight to gain back ground that was previously lost over the past couple of decades. Uh, but I think you're, you're I think actually both of those books, uh, the book that you wrote on nationalism and then also conservatism, a rediscovery, are very, very important. Um, so I'm going to ask you just kind of at the start of this conversation, what, what is really the meaning of conservatism? When, when we talk about conservatism, we, we're talking about a, a political standpoint that sees the uh, the traditions of the religious traditions, the national traditions, uh, as the key to strengthening and maintaining any country through time. And uh, in in my book, I, I I compare conservatism to uh, to liberalism. Liberalism is you know kind of the uh, the paradigm, the worldview, the framework through which people have you know both both Democrats and Republicans have thought about politics for most of the period since World War II. And when we're talking about liberalism, we're talking about uh, a starting point. You start a political uh, political liberal theory from uh, from the idea of the free, the free and equal individual. Uh, human beings are free and equal by nature and uh, and moral obligation and political obligation only arise by consent. And the purpose of government is only to defend your your liberties. Uh, that's a very, very familiar set of uh, set of ideas. And uh, you know, a whole lot of people have thought that liberalism is the answer for a long time. But I think by this point, you know certainly by the year twenty twenty, uh, we we see that the liberal institutions in America and in Britain and other countries have have basically collapsed. I mean, they 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 have they have turned into woke neo-marxist institutions. And mm -hmm. that's the new dominant idea. And so a lot of people are asking right now, what, what about conserving? How do you conserve things? Well, we don't yeah. seem to have conserved anything really for generations. A lot of young people asking that. And so the, the, the discussion of why we need conservatism has never been more pressing than at this moment. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I, I you know, if, if it, somebody has been born, let's say after the year 2000 or even 2001, I think of of 9-11, 2001, that literally changed the world. And it, it, it changed it geopolitically, but it changed it in terms of global security and information and technology, and just sort of how we think about government and, and travel and everything else. Um, you know, we, I, I don't think in the, in the 90s, at the, after the, the end of the Cold War, um, we, we saw the threat of uh, terrorism, but then we also saw the threat to the nation state in response to terrorism, which is really interesting. But most most people born after the year 2000, if they were to find conservatism or liberalism, and you talk a lot about this in your book, um, they have a different understanding fundamentally 
than the histories of both of those words. Um, you, you spend a great deal of time, uh, you know, in the first part of your book, basically walking through British and American histories and the foundations of conservatism. And it's interesting to note how inseparable the Anglo-American political histories are, uh, both with regard to conservatism and liberalism. So I just wanted, I wanted you to talk just maybe a little bit about both the historical meaning, but then also the contemporary, because in the contemporary, it's very different. Well, I'm, people use the word conservative in all sorts of ways. And uh, there, there is, has been since the, uh, well, let, let, let's, let's say that in the 1980s, I think that's sort of like, a convenient place when you know when when I was growing up and the, during the Reagan Thatcher years, there was kind of like this this um, common definition of conservatism. Uh, Ir Irving Kristol famously said, "Modern conservatism is based on on three pillars." I'm sure you've heard this: R religion, nationalism, and economic growth. And that was you know most people agreed about that as late as the 1980s, but after the fall of the Berlin Wall, uh, there, there there's kind of a, you know, this this uh, rush of, I, I would say, arrogance, utopianism, uh, feeling like that's it, you know, communism and fascism have been defeated, there are no more challenges. And uh, at, at that point, <laughs> the, the religion and nationalism dropped out for a lot mm -hmm. of people, uh, people kept using the word conservatism, but you know, if you think about that new world order that the uh, that the Bush administration and subsequent Republicans, uh, you know, the, the 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 freedom agenda, there wasn't much religion and there wasn't much nationalism in in that idea. The word conservatism came to be used as uh, you know the the. the what used to be called liberalism, liberal internationalism, started being called conservatism, and so ideas like, uh, well, you know, everybody in the world needs to have the same basic freedoms and liberties that that Americans do, and uh, um, and and the thing to do is if people don't just, you know, accept the end of history, then the thing to do is that you know we can invade their countries and 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 make them because this is the only reasonable way to live, so. For about a generation, we we did have we we did have a lot of people using the word conservatism for something which was uh, much closer to a, a a revolutionary worldwide liberalism than something capable of conserving anything. And when you talk to ask people like, what are you doing? Like, how is this conserving things? That, you know, invading other countries and and overthrowing their traditions. How is that conserving anything? They'd say, oh well, that's true. But what we're conserving is liberalism. Anyway, this has all run its course because because this this whole worldview has has uh, brought America and the Western nations to uh, to uh, the, the the edge of collapse. I mean, you, yeah. you you can't go indefinitely saying, well, our 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 job is to impose liberalism on the entire world, and uh, and if that means um, you know that that individuals can uh, build up big corporations. Uh, that suppress free, free speech in America, that's fine because it's private property and liberalism defends it. Or if uh, wealthy individuals decide that they're going to offshore America's manufacturing abilities to China, build up a, a massive new em enemy to the United States, well, that's fine because you know it's individual human freedoms that we're defending. And if every kid ends up with with pornography on his uh, on his smartphone when he's 12 years old, what used to be called hardcore, the worst of the stuff, is is just flowing like a sewer into into every phone. And you, you say, how can how can we defend this? And people say, well, it's individual liberties. You know, we can't restrain the you know free market from distributing things that people want. This is this has brought us brought us to neo Marxism, and it's brought us to the edge, to the very very end of what people can put up with. And at this point, I think either people rediscover the original meaning of the word conservatism, which means traditionalism, which means uh, figuring out what we need to do to preserve ourselves to and to hand down the things that our fathers and our mothers that, that they used to know. If, if we don't do that, we're finished. Mm. 
So well said. I, I, I want to just add anecdotally, uh, when I was at the University of Texas at Austin studying economics, um, you know, the, the, the big, um, the orthodoxy at that time was free trade, global trade, um, you know, building markets around the world, especially in China. Uh, if, if you look to the example of Hong Kong in the past, we're just going to make China like what Hong Kong used to be. Uh, Milton Friedman oftentimes would use China in his his paradigm back in the 1970s, free to choose. By the way, um, he disparaged so much. I think it was in his Nobel Peace Prize winning speech in 1993. He said how illiberal Western de democracies were becoming. Uh, they were becoming more socialistic, whereas the former Soviet countries were becoming far more conservative because they had lived through uh, the oppression of, of uh, communism. Um, and so the, the former Marxist countries were becoming increasingly more conservative, Poland and Hungary and those other nations. Um, whereas the West, you know, France, uh, 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 Britain, uh, the United States were adopting increasingly more um, socialistic, um, you know, um, policies uh, when it comes to taxation and, and, and Keynesian theories and so on and so forth. Um, but let me, let me jump to this. Um, what is conservatism as a paradigm? So you talk, uh, you talk about religion, uh, you talk, Irving Crystal's three pillars, religion um, and, 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 and tradition. Uh, what, what though for you are those, um, you know, I guess you've got four, is that right? Uh, well, that shape our understanding of government and so on and so forth. Well, the, the basic worldview that, that, that underlies uh, the thinking of conservatives and here I'm talking about traditionalists, people who value nation and tradition and family. The basic, uh, the the basic principles that underlie it are that human beings are are born into families, tribes, and nations. Right. This is not the kind of thing that you that you find in uh, Enlightenment rationalist theories. This is the kind of thing you 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 do find in in the Bible. If you if you know the Bible well then you'll see human beings are born into into families tribes and nations and uh and, and it's true that an individual might might switch to a different nation but your obligations always come from the uh from the the national inheritance which is uh, s supposed to be an expression of god's will and so this is kind of you know this this is kind of a this this biblical view is something that it was well known in in different parts of Christian history, and so cer certainly the uh, after the Reformation and the return to uh, Hebrew Scripture as as a political text, uh, you you see this this a lot that a, a nation a nation has uh, it, it, it's it's made up of different parts it's made up of families people are supposed to be loyal to their nation and the nation has a responsibility to be in covenant with God, so. The, that morals and you know the, the the basic moral framework and political framework comes from the fact that the the nation, in order to be legitimate, is in covenant with God. Now, all of this, you know, all of this stuff it used to be extremely well known to conservatives, and it was you know part of the uh, the English and American inheritance for a thousand years. And uh, what what's happened is that after after World War II. Um, really, the the traumas of the two world wars brought people in America and across Europe to say, um, "Look, we want to we want to start from scratch. We don't we don't want any of this biblical inheritance. Uh, religion, you know, only causes trouble. Nationalism only causes trouble." And they decided that they were going to, you know, basically adopt a new constitution, which would be based entirely on nothing but the the, the, the individual liberties, uh, the, the liberties of individuals. And that's that's when you get to see the banning, literally the banning of God and scripture and uh, and prayer from from schools across America, which had a tremendous impact on also also on the on, on, on the rest of the democratic world. And and it's two generations. Look, it's two generations from the moment that the United States banned God and scripture from the schools to the point where people can't honestly, seriously, can't tell the difference between a man and a woman anymore. And and, and yeah, we have to understand what what we did. I mean, what what was done was to was 
to, to say. God and scripture and tradition, all those things can be privatized, all right, because, because the individuals make the right decisions. And, and it's a straight line from there to where we are. Yeah, so well said. I mean, I, going back to just the biblical understanding, I, you are a uh, practicing Orthodox Jew. Um, I'm a Reformed Baptist. And, and as we look at the scriptures, we understand the paradigm that's offered. In our covenant understanding of God, he's the covenant making God. It's our vertical relationship with God that comes first. And then our horizontal relationship with those in community, the covenant of marriage is, is a reflection of that. So what God put together, let no man tear asunder. When you think about the radical individualism that oftentimes defines uh, libertarianism or even modern liberalism, uh, what, you, what you see is that there is no a uh, sense of res moral responsibility or accountability to uh, those who are most immediate uh, in relationship to you as an individual, which would be your family. Uh, whether if you're a child, it'd be your mother and father, your sister and brother. Uh, as an adult, it's, it's your spouse um, and, your, and your children that you're responsible for. But if you notice, and I've, I, I, I do appreciate that, conservatism goes back to that old tradition that's fundamental that, that even holds that the atoms of the society are not the individuals, but the family itself is the atom of society, the core unit that's inseparable. You can't, you can't break that apart. And that's fundamental then to understanding uh, the relationship that the government has, or even an ecclesiastical institution, uh, religious institution, that the, the family governance is so critical um, you know, to then frame out and build upon our understanding of freedom. Um, but I, I want to I say this real fast, um, Dr. Hizoni, when you consider the Maoist revolution and, and cultural Marxism, it was to get rid of these things. Yeah. Uh, you know, old customs, old religion, old tradition, old laws, all of those things to break down the fabric of society, starting with the family. So Marxism insists on a radical individualism as well. Uh, and and uh, it was in Russia that they celebrated, this was in Soviet Russia, uh, children turning their parents in, for example. Yeah, so I, I think you're right. I think the comparison is, is frightening, but it's, it, it, it's appropriate. America is, has since since the 1960s at least america has been undergoing a cultural revolution and it's true that this cultural revolution is has been slower than you know than let you know the what the Mao, maoists or or what stalin wanted to do because you know the, the, they they thought that they could just do the entire you know the complete revolution uh you know within a few years and here it's taken 60 years but the results are the results are the same. I mean, people people don't don't believe that we need families anymore. Now, I mean, I know lots of people do, but now I'm talking about in general, if like what's going on with society, what's going on with America, and 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 across Europe, and what's what is happening? What's happening is is that you know, it's a free country. Why do people only have 1.6 children in America? I mean, that, 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 that's a catastrophe. That you know, that that right there is the end of the nation. People don't people people don't want to have children. And I, I, I myself, uh, my wife and I have, thank God, we, we we have nine children, and now we have grandchildren. We've raised a lot of children, and I can tell you, it it touches everyone, even in every corner of religious society. The kids are now they. I'm talking about the good ones, the ones who are loyal, the ones who, who who are pious, the ones who believe in God and study Scripture. They hesitate before getting married. They hesitate before having children because they can see that people can't don't know how to keep families together anymore. And they say, well, you know, if I get married, then who's to stop the same thing from happening to me? That question is completely reasonable in a society that that has lost the thread and doesn't doesn't know how to give honor to people who get married, doesn't know how to give honor for, for having children or, or for that matter, for serving in the military or for serving in government. I mean, for, for studying scripture, people do not give honor to any of the things that traditionally held the society together. Everything's supposed, it's like this, this equality of choices. You wanna, you wanna get married, that's good. You, you, you wanna 
not get married for another 25 years or never, that's fine. You you want to get married but not have children. You want to have a, an unusual kind of family, not the traditional family. All these things are fine because because the liberty of the individual has has been ele which is of course a precious thing, but at this point it's been elevated to the exclusive sole value. And when you elevate liberty of the individual to the exclusive sole value, and you say just do whatever feels good, do whatever you yeah, think, yeah. as long as as long as you, my lovely son or daughter, my kids in my classroom, as long as as you consent to what you're doing and you're happy with it, then it's fine. But it's not fine. And that's it. That's 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 where we have to draw the line at this point. We have to say, no, we, we were wrong. It's not fine to choose whatever you want to do. It's just not fine. And the, you know, the, it's, uh, and sorry to interrupt there, but yeah, just to say this, uh, it's very Rousseauian. Uh, when you think about, you know, how the French Revolution um, and, and liberty and equality and, 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 and their construction was very humanistic. Um, it, you know, it, it didn't, it was a, it was egalitarian, uh, and, and, and it was, it predated Marxism. Um, but it was based on a, almost based on a kind of dialectic, but it was very, um, humanistic, um, and, and anti-God. And the whole idea was to usher in the age of reason. Um, yep. you devote an entire chapter to God, scripture, family, congregation. I love what you say at one point in your book that there is no alternative to God and scripture. I wholeheartedly amen that. Um, I, I really appreciate you including that there. Um, we talk about family, but why is it so important that God and scripture are, are foundational uh, to understanding conservatism? Look, the, the, there's a whole, look, that's a very, very complicated subject. There's a lot of, a, a lot of, a lot of things that God does that God does for us and the scripture does for us. But to make it uh, really simple, just, you know, just as a starting, just as a starting point, the, the, uh, you referred to the French Revolution and the French Revolution, as, as you said, they believed in what they called the religion of reason. Uh, they be, and, and what was this religion? The, the, the assertion was that human beings are all, all of us are endowed, equipped, with reason that if we exercise it, then we will all come to the, the fundamental basic moral truths and political truths that are true for all human beings through all history. Okay, this, this is a what's called an enlightenment rationalist view of morals and politics. And the French Revolution believed in that. And of course, within a few years, rivers of blood were, were, were flowing in France and then millions of people died across Europe because of this religion of reason. But in the United States, this religion of reason, which what it does is it, it claims that reason can come in place of scripture. Reason, human reason can come in place of Christianity or Judaism. It can come in place of tradition. And when you do that, when you, when you say, reason is enough human reason is enough what you do is you put your mind in the place of god's mind you put yourself in place of god and every place where that's happened you know whether whether it's been liberal countries or communist countries every single place where this religion of reason has declared reason is sufficient it's going to answer all our questions God and scripture and tradition are, are the three things that are immediately shoved aside. Reason replaces them. And the belief that reason can replace the foundations, the moral foundations that we get from scripture and, and the framework for life that we get from living in covenant with God. The belief that you can replace those things with reason is false. It's a complete, it's, it's simply an utter falsehood. And we've tried it over and over again for centuries. And every society that tries it gets destroyed. How many more times do we have to try it? Wow. Very, very well said. I just want to um, finally ask you this. Uh, with regard to your own journey, uh, how did you become a conservative? Uh, my basic conservative values I got from sitting next to my father and watching the, the evening news 
when I when I was a boy, and uh, you know my 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 father was um, uh, was not himself a a religious man, but he believed in religion. You know he 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 would he would always look at what was happening on the news, and he would say, look. This is what's happening to a country that's falling apart. It doesn't have moral fiber. The reason they don't have moral fiber is because they've thrown religion aside. As far as me personally, you know, he, he always told me that that you know that we we were not living as you know as as good Jews should, and that if I wanted to live as a good Jew, I needed to go visit my my uncle Itzhak and my aunt Linda in in Israel. They're Orthodox Jews with six children. And when I was 18, that's what I did. I went and I spent a year in Israel, and I spent all of the Sabbaths and holidays with them, and uh, and that that changed my life. I mean, I I was able to see very quickly that that the lives their children were growing up with were better than mine, and uh, in I mean in just about every way. And I I I you know so I I owe it to my father that he told me go look in that place, but uh, but my book is devoted to my aunt and uncle. Uh, who who gave me a model of what what a traditional family is, which is not the nuclear family. What what a family that is connected to 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 a congregation, to other families in a congregation that that's living a life uh, in in honor of and in the service of God. That was the first time that I ever got to see it. And when I went back to uh, uh, to college, uh, I met a young woman, and and we decided we were going to we were going to uh, lead that kind of life together. And and that is, in fact, what we did. Wow. Fantastic. So you were given a paradigm, essentially, from uh, from the lives of, of your own family. And I love what you, you, you distinguish between the nuclear and the traditional. And again, I wholeheartedly amen that. The reality being that uh, the example we've been given is thousands of years, and it comes from God himself, and it's not based on some sort of 1950s, 1960s, post-World War II or industrial uh, idea of of the family, but uh, one that comes straight out of Scripture. Dr. Hazoni, thank you so much uh, for uh, joining the Give Me Liberty podcast, and certainly for this book. Where can people find it? Uh, the, The book is Conservatism, A Rediscovery. And uh, it's on Amazon and Barnes and Noble and Book Depository and every place else. You, you can order it everywhere you buy books. Awesome. Stick around, folks, for final thoughts. Hey, thank you for tuning in to the Give Me Liberty podcast. Wasn't that a great conversation with Dr. Hazoni? Certainly when you're talking about conservatism, it's important to know that we are talking about the transcendentals, the good, the beautiful, the true, without which we don't have foundations upon which to build. We know that loyalty and honor and respect and truth, all of those things are really important. You can't have any kind of conservatism without it. But what I really enjoy about his book and something that I would challenge you to go read and find is that he says, God, scripture, family, and congregation, these are the four elements that if you disintegrate those, you have no semblance of conservatism. Those things are absolutely important. Uh, Inextricably linked to conservatism is God and scripture. By what authority do we confess and believe these truths? They have to come from the word of God ultimately. And I love how he does that. Even as he does that as an Orthodox Jew uh, holding to the Old Testament, uh, we as Christians believe that all of scripture is God-breathed. The unification of the whole is the Old and New Testament fulfilled ultimately in Jesus Christ, who did not come to abolish the law or the prophets, but ultimately to fulfill all. Super, super important. I hope you enjoyed that conversation. Definitely check out the book. I think it's worthwhile. And until next time, God bless you all.